Um, thank you so much for joining us. And one of the first things I was going to tell you all is that we do record these programs and then we put them on the library website so that people who couldn't make it can watch them later. If you're very, very seriously unhappy about that, then you, know, you need to be aware and you have the option to leave the meeting, but, um, or just make yourself invisible and then doesn't really matter. Having a bad hair day or whatever. You know. um, so um, could you please stay muted during Lucia's presentation? And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. And you can ask questions either in person at the end by raising your hand or clicking so that a little electronic hand picture shows up or typing them into the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, so any of those will work fine. And if it's the middle of the talk and you think of a question, if you put it in the chat, then at the end, we'll get to your question then. Um, before I introduce Lucia, I, I did want to introduce our brand new librarian, Jen Dupree. I don't know, Jen, if you would like to be visible, but we have a new librarian at the library. She's been in post for 10 days. There she is. So if you haven't met her and if you are a level resident, do go and say hello. We are absolutely delighted that she's joined the library. And she's our sort of technical host for this evening's talk. Um, so I think um, what I'm going to do now is introduce the topic. Uh, oh, I know, sorry, one bit of background. There are two handouts that Lucia has prepared and you might quite like to have them with you while the talk's going on. If you would like to do that, um, if you go to the library website under her talk, you will see links um, on the section of the library website that, should, that describes her talk. There are links to these handouts. And one of them is a list of some of the native plants she'll be discussing. And one of them is a list of, not a list, a, a summary of some of the questions you need to ask yourself about your garden when you're making decisions about how to plant it. Those documents will stay up for at least a week or so on the website. So you don't have to have them right now, you could get them later, but I'm just letting you know they're there. Um, okay, so tonight's topic is native plants for your landscape, which plants where? And our speaker, Lucia Terry, uh, runs Perennial Point of View, a wonderful uh, landscape garden operation in Bridgeton. I should declare an interest. She's done two gardens for me and they're wonderful. Um, and she's, it was started by her parents in the 1970s. So Lucia is a real Bridgeton native. She's carried on the family business. Uh, and she really is knowledgeable about native species that will grow in a range of different conditions that we have right here in Maine. Uh, she's been doing this for more than 30 years. So she's highly experienced. Uh, and I'm going to leave it to her to really tell you the details of, of, of her talk this evening. So she's going to share her screen now. And if you, you have in the top of your screen a view option, and if you choose the view once her slides come up, if you, if you wish to, you can choose the view that says side-by-side -side speaker, and then you will see Lucia's side, slides and you will see Lucia herself, and you won't be distracted by me or anybody else. But that's your own choice, what you do there. So long as you can see her slides, I can see them fine, so I think they're working. So with no further ado, can I hand over, please, to Lucia? Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, um, Moira already shared a little bit about who I am and my history. I started doing stuff with plants with my mom when her business perennial point of view became too busy for her to really do on her own. And it became, you know, all the kids and my dad. And so it was really, truly a family business. Um, ah, Lucia, you're muted. Can't hear you. Say something. Okay, can you hear me yeah. now? Yes, we can hear you. I now. don't know why it mutes itself because I didn't. Neither do it. I. But we're fi you're fine now. Okay, I'll keep checking Good. to be sure. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I was um, just um, adding a little bit more of my my background, my history. Um, truly a family business uh, that my mom started in the 70s. And um, by the 80s, um, she was a bit overwhelmed with the work. And so it became really, truly me and my sisters. And then when grandchildren came along, they were all part of it as well. Um, I, the idea of, of ecological landscaping, which it was named at some point, 
And then the idea of growing native plants came very naturally to me um, and then has become over these 30 years kind of my, my uh, you know, true, true calling, I think. Um, I don't, I don't in my gardens, I, I'm not a purist. I don't use only native plants. I use um, lots of other plants as well, but certainly I always consider first if there's a native plant that could do what I need it to do. Um, I was uh, inspired by a book back in the early eight or mid eighties, I guess, um, called Noah's Garden written by Sarah Stein who is um, gone now. And that really opened my eyes and turned me around. And um, I, I would recommend it um, to anybody um, if you haven't read it. Um, so we're gonna talk mostly about plants. Um, I, I can't really help myself because designing is my thing. And I think of des good design as like the foundation for everything. So there's gonna be a lot of that because even the best native plant, if it's not part of a good design, it's probably not gonna be too successful. Um, so uh, participants, um, wait, I have to move my screen, right? That was me. Um, so I'm imagining uh, you all out there um, thinking, thinking about um, what your needs and desires are for your property. Put it off there in case you want to use that computer. Right now it's on board. Can you please mute Hello. yourselves? Um, what kind of projects or plantings are you, are you looking to do? What kind of help might you need? And what could compel you to get more native plants into the ground in your landscapes? Um, so I see a, a third participant um, are the native plants themselves. So for our purposes, we're gonna define native plant as native species. And we're going to include plants whose range might be as wide as from Canada, south to North Carolina, west to the Rockies, more or less. Though most are found in northeastern US and many are found in Maine of the plants that I grow and use that I'll be talking about. These little pictures are, these are uh, baby native plants at my place and these are more grown up seedlings. This is all very spring, can't wait for April, right? Um, I, in, in, my, in my native plant list, um, you'll notice I, I, have, I have included um, cultivars of native plants. I use these freely in addition to species, um, especially in the case of plants with a high value for native pollinators, because it seems that most cultivars don't quite have the same value as the species. So no need to fret, you can have them all, just um, mix them up. Um, uh, sourcing a wide variety of native species gets a little easier each year. There are many resources out there from mail order catalogs to seeding your own. Um, Maine nurseries are offering more of them or offering more native plants, um, but it's still tough to find a, a wide variety. My nursery is small, but I've been growing and using native plants for 30 years. Um, in, my in my baby native plants program, I offer native species plugs at cost plus handling to help you get a lot of plants in the ground. This sale is available each spring with a list usually between 10 and 15 types of things um, from around mid-May till the end of June. And uh, that list is posted. Um, the baby natives has its own little section. So moving on, um, planting and managing for success. So this is where you start with, by get, gathering information. And these are all kind of steps that anybody really can do to make a planting successful. Um, learn your landscape, learn your soil, learn your exposure. Where's that west wind coming from? And the light in all seasons. So um, I don't know how many times I've run into, into 
clients who, oh, yeah, it's sunny. It's because it's July, it's sunny. But for seven months of the year, um, it's like completely shaded because the woods are so close. So these are all really good things to, to know and to even map out or make notes about. Um, some, some of you may be mostly interested in adding native species to your perennial garden. There's a particular way that's really good to do that and to carefully choose and manage the plants. Not all native species are gonna play well in a garden. They're going to be um, too strong growing. They're going to get too tall and they're gonna shade other things. So it's good to, to choose things like you, 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 maybe you have a uh, Monarda fistulosa, but you don't maybe let its patches just grow for three years without, without taking pieces of them out because they'll spread across the whole garden. Um, others of you may be interested in putting in a native planting to fill in an otherwise non-functioning area in a beautiful and sustainable way. This is what many of our native plants were born to do, um, is to accomplish those two objectives of taking care of a problem spot and having a native plant colony all, all at once. These, um, this is a, a, a particular project that um, it, it sort of speaks to thinking about the design of your landscape and informed by practical needs as well as personal preference. These two photos are both of a, of a project for uh, a, a woman who is a, a true plants woman and, in, and a native plant student. And um, we're on about the fourth year now and we've, al we've already expanded these, these gardens, but her criteria was everything had to be two of three things. Tall, meaning three feet plus, a native species and fragrant. So it's been very, very interesting. And we, we haven't, we've included maybe a few things that didn't meet two of those, but for the most part, we've met two, if not all three of those with this entire collection. It's been uh, pretty interesting. Preparation. Preparation is really important. Um, doing, that, doing that mapping is part of preparation. Um, these are the questions that were in the, um, in the worksheet. Um, so the first is, what are the constraints of your property? Um, managing for light, for soil conditions, use constraints like vehicular access, leach beds, or fuel tanks. It's a great exercise and, and really helps to um, inform your choices of what to plant where. Um, these, these, two, um, this, these are two particular constraints. So the one on the left is a new planting in Bridgeton of a, a, a new parking lot that was left with these very small, completely surrounded with curbing, so no water, um, planting areas, including this very narrow, it's almost, it's not quite even three feet in a few places, right along the sidewalk where it needs to look great all the time and has absolutely no water. So choosing um, a group of plants for that was, was really interesting and we shall see how it all turns out. Um, there are a couple of non-natives in there but um, it is predominantly a, a repeated planting of, um, of, of native plants designed to really get very thick and full, cover the ground and to of course be beautiful all seasons of the year. Um, the uh, right hand picture is um, a drainage swale that I planted years ago is a wet, 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 soggy place. It's now very grown up and I wish I could have quickly found a picture from more from the last couple of years because it's really gorgeous and filled out um, with uh, amelanchier, uh, blueberry, dwarf arctic willow, um, ilex, a joe pie weed, sensitive fern, pachyra, and um, of course there's a couple things like the obligatory daylily clumps. 
but it has done um, amazingly well and keeps this area so that you can actually walk through it um, a couple days after a big rain, you can walk right, right through the path. So it's really done, done very well. So um, more preparation. Uh, what native species plants do you have already that perhaps could be encouraged, added to, transplanted? Um, these, these pictures are um, low bush blueberry, which a lot of us have on our properties. It's very easy to, to um, transplant and add to so that you get more of it. And the right-hand one is the um, lovely ostrich fern, Matusha struthiopterus, which is also found on many, many properties. And um, so that's, that's another good uh, preparation. Um, oh, along with native plants would be, the, part of that same survey would be um, what non-native invasive species do you have on your property? We all have those as well. And the removal of these needs to be an ongoing exercise. You can't ever let up. Um, and that is just, it's, a, it's something we all have to deal with. So the um, third of those questions is uh, where can you create some transformation? So this is, this is like a design thing to figure out where to put a native planting. Um, focus on lawn areas you don't use, driveway edges, low spots, unmanageable slopes, drip edges under roof eaves, transitional spaces along paths or against the woods or another edge, broad transitional borders between minimized lawns and woods or fields or neighbors um, are perfect places for native plantings, places that you can mow once a year and monitor, but that, that will add so much to your landscape without, without having to be mowed and trimmed and like a lawn. Um, these, are, these, these are just trans, transformations. Um, in, this, in the left-hand picture, um, this was a, was a place, I don't know, I've been there about 12 years maybe, started out just this big broad lawn, um, kind of a messy, not deep enough buffer of mostly bracken fern along the edge of the lake. And um, these little little beds around some of the trees with all non-natives in them use and, and big juniper plants. And it was just, it was pretty awful. And um, so we have been establishing um, these expanded areas using the trees and closing in the lawn in between. We planted a, a deep, about 12 foot deep buffer all along the, the lakeside. It's not all native plants, but there certainly are a lot of them showing right here. There's a lovely clump in front of this rock on the left-hand picture of Chrysogonum. And um, that's a wonderful native ground cover that you can see it makes a it makes a wonderful big clump. And there's all, all kinds of ferns um, there in that picture as well. The right hand, whoops. Back again, sorry. The right hand picture is uh, my, my own apple tree garden uh, developed from just scruffy grass under these ancient um, architecture apples. <laughs> um, and so this is another area that uh, is just kind of a lost space otherwise, and now it's all full of native ground covers and ferns. And um, so those are two two kind of two kind of ideas um, for for transformation. Um, to be. The goal of all of our plantings, of these kinds of plantings, would be to be sustainable and eventually be self-sustaining. Um, to to use less less water, less energy, less work um, over time. And native plants, with their um, with their need to create uh, colonies, 
really do a wonderful job. Um, In, in the garden, a lot of these plants will, will grow together, but in a, in a native planting where you can intentionally create large patches and they will make colonies, um, this is how we can really make a, a big impact, both with covering our ground as well as with getting a lot of native plants onto our properties. Um, careful combinations so that the taller things don't shade the smaller things. You would typically not um, grow, for instance, a true ground cover and then plant tall uh, grasses or, or four foot tall plants because the ground cover will end up getting no light and will end up not really doing very well. So plant densely, plant in layers. Um, a good, a good ground cover layer for a taller planting is, is sort of those things that are two, two and a half feet tall. They're much more apt to get in between and to get enough light to cover the ground. Um, planting densely. Yeah, so most, most things will, will tell you how, you know, how, how, far, how far apart to space them. But when you're planting plugs, for instance, um, it, you have to do a lot of looking into how big those plants are gonna grow because they start so tiny. But um, I always suggest for people to plant densely, the sooner those plants fill that space, the, uh, the sooner you're gonna have less work to do. Um, and cover covering, which uh, I, I use covering more than I use mulching as a term because the, the bark mulch um, craze has, has just become so overdone. Um, I like to think of it as cover, which sometimes is bark mulch, but it can be lots of other things as well. So a young planting, you really want to cover the ground until the plants can cover the ground, but um, you want to do it very carefully. Um, I see one of the most difficult things that I see in trying to recover gardens and plantings is the over mulching, the uh, layers and layers of mulch with no, with no thought. And then the crowns of the plants get buried and some of them can handle that and they take over the whole garden and the others just disappear. So that's a, a good thing to be really careful about. So um, there's, there's something that I was just reading the other day um, about lo looking at your property and, and planting from the top down. And what, what's meant by that is um, some adding to, to the edge of your woods, planting trees and planting shrubs has more value um, way more value to wildlife than the same amount of perennials and garden and meadow. Um, so it's a really good thing to think about that maybe instead of trying to have a, a perennials or grasses right up to the edge of the woods, put a few uh, flowering understory trees and some shrubs in there and let that fill in that sort of 10 or 20 feet. Um, it, it's just a really good, great thing to do for wildlife. Um, so young native species trees, um, you know, maple, birch, oak, just you can, young, young trees are very easy to find, very easy to plant by hand. They do very well. You gotta keep the deer off of them um, in whatever way you choose to do that for, for a while but um, really has a great, great effect. This is just a list of um, just, it's probably even just a partial list of um, the, the big native shrubs that I use all the time and that you all probably all know and you've seen them all, a lot of these grow um, in our woods or along the lake. Um, these are actually some labeled pictures about, this is where we get to start choosing things and looking at them. So um, this, the top from the left is 
uh, Amelanchier uh, canadensis, which is one of my favorite things in the world that I use on a lot of my jobs. You see it on the roadsides in the spring. It's, it's, uh, I think it's the first thing after the cherries to, to bloom and it's just, just lovely. The middle picture is Amelanchier with its fall color, which is really gorgeous. The, um, on the right hand side is a, is a red bud in my mom's yard. And yes, that is some old gold, whoops. That's some old gold flame spirea. It has now been eradicated. And I would warn you all, if you have spirea on your property, you should really be doing something about it because it's pretty bad. Cert there's certain, certain species that are okay, but all, all, of, the, all of the regular normal, normal ones are pretty awful. Um, so this is the viburnum acerifolia and maple leaf viburnum that, that uh, a lot of us have in our woods. It's just lovely. Um, this is a planting that I did years ago in the middle of um, Ilex verticillata grown against um, a garage um, in what was a spot that the driveway and the side of the garage kind of drains to there. So it's done very well and it's underplanted with hay scented fern that we dug out of their woods and moved. And it has really been lovely. And um, I wish I had a picture of it all in its berries, but I didn't, um, wasn't able to find one quickly. On the right is, um, is a deer vela lonicera that's been for a long time in a planting um, right next to Beth's Cafe. And I took this picture recently this fall because the new, it's, it, it, it sports this new growth when it starts getting cold weather. And it was like trying to match the shutter color that she had chosen. So I thought it was pretty sweet. Um, but that's just, um, that's a few of those to start. These are a few more. That's Ilex verticillata, we all know. The um, Comptonia sweet, sweet fern um, is, a, is a wonderful, useful, lovely ground cover at a really great height, easy to kind of push through and walk through, but um, tall enough that it covers the ground really well and doesn't let much grow. Like you don't really find a lot of tree sprouts and things in a bed of Comptonia. And then the top is the fall foliage of uh, Rus aromatica, which I use a lot, just the straight species Rus aromatica. And there's Rus, there's probably four species that I use. They're all just extraordinary plants and wonderful. And on the right is um, buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis, which grows all along the shores. Um, it's known for loving wet, but it actually, does pretty well in a, is a, in a reasonably deep garden soil, like not a gritty rocky soil, but in a reasonably deep soil, it will do pretty well right in the garden. It's really, it's a lovely, a lovely shrub. Choose plants that best suit the space you have. So after you've done all this homework, figured out, oh yeah, my soil really is rocky and all those things um, and where the shade is, once you do that, then, then then you can choose plants that will thrive in the space you have. Because amazingly, there are so many of our native plants who just, they don't want any fuss. They don't want deep garden soil. They can't stand it. Like they'll just curl up and die. So fi finding those is really great. Um, this left-hand picture is hay scented fern, which I use a lot. It's a fabulous ground cover just beautiful all the time, smells wonderful. In the right-hand picture is uh, actually a planter, um, uh, but the, the top is the Lictrum diocum, which is early meadow rue, which is um, new to me, maybe the last four or five years, and just really, really special. Um, makes a kind of a ground cover, frothy mass of beautiful foliage, probably about maybe 30 inches tall. Uh, and it's just, it's just lovely, lovely to live with, like dry shade. And it uh, has a little, uh, a nice clump of um, Heuchera Americana, palace purple growing, growing with it. I think I did those for the library in the spring, I think. Okay, so we'll go back for a minute. And uh, now, so, 
to catch my notes up to the pictures is hard to split everything up. So in, in my work, what I run into over and over again um, as, a, as a citing, just to have an example, is what I call partly, partly in dry. So it's some degree of sun and shade, usually more on the shady end um, most of the year um, and dry. I mean, this is just typically, I would say probably 75 easily, if not 80% of what I run into everywhere. So it could well be that it's what some of you folks have as well. So I've done plant profiles for top 10, top 10 picks for adaptability for a wide range of partly, partly and dry. And we'll just, I'll just go through them pretty quickly. You've got all the information right here. So Amsonia tabernae montana is a, is a lovely meadow native from a little bit more south than here, but it, it does beautifully here. Um, this is on the left, you see it in flower, it makes a large clump of bushy foliage that's kind of shiny, this has a wonderful presence. Flowers in the spring with these kind of denim blue flowers. Um, grows in a, in a sandy soil with minimal water, adapts nicely to less than full sun, even though it loves full sun. Um, it gets fantastic seed pods that last all summer long, kind of like bright mint green seed pods, and then develops these beautiful fall colors, um, everything from a buttery yellow to gold to this wonderful bronzy apricot color. It's really a, a stunning plant and the cultivars that are out there are equally stunning and I use all of them with, with uh, great abandon. Um, Aruncus diocus, so always, always been known as, as goat's beard, but when I looked it up to get a little more information about it, having used it for 30 years, um, I saw that it also was called bride's feathers, and I kind of like that. So I'm going to call it bride's feathers from now on for a common name. Um, so you all know, I mean, this is, you know, it's old fashioned, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. You know, people dig up the seedlings and pass them out. But it really is in its own right, a, a really wonderful native plant with a lot going for it. Um, wonderful form, wonderful adaptability from almost completely bony dry to wet and from almost complete shade where it will still have a nice presence in flower to quite a lot of sun. So it's really highly adaptable and huge attraction for pollinators. Um, this, the picture on the left is one of my uh, many aruncus. Um, it all in flower in June, June into July. And then the one on the right is, um, uh, you'll, you'll see it in the, in the middle behind the, the blue, the, um, yeah, it's with the rust, this is the fall, the fall color of it. Um, it's the fall color of the seed heads, um, which you just leave on because they're so beautiful. Anyway, it's really stunning and very, very useful. It throws a lot of seeds, but they're very easy to yank out or to, or to dig and pass around. Um, wonderful for hedging, make a whole hedgerow of it. Um, a really a delightful plant, um, always shows up. Um, Aster de Vericatus, we all know this one well too. Nobody doesn't have this on their property, white wood aster. Um, high, high value for pollinators. Um, and, and really wonderful in the landscape for its ability to fill in underneath plantings. And then when every, all the other plants are maybe getting a little tired, it puts on this extraordinary show of these, you know, it's called white wood aster and it's described as being white, but there's every shade of white and silver and lavender and powder blue. It's really, really quite a lovely thing to have. I use this also as a, as a ground cover under trees and shrubs, and um, it's, it's really wonderful for filling in. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're planting in your garden, 
like your perennial garden, um, you might want to control it. You might want to cut it back before it fluffs all of its seeds all over the place because it does seed in profusely, which is one of its great um, pluses um, as, a, as a native landscape plant. It's a great colonizer. Um, the, these are probably the two sedges, Carex, that I use the most. I couldn't decide which one, so I just did both of them. So on the left is Pennsylvanica. This little the photo shows it um, just coming into bloom with its little kind of, I don't know, tobacco brown, I guess, dark, dark, dark brown, almost black, little, little flowers. And um, really um, a wonderful ground cover um, six inches or so tall with kind of a sweeping swirling habit. Um, does very well in dry shade, thrives in a little bit of sun, plays well, like will we'll grow in underneath everything, but it's very lightly rooted. So you can just take a rake and pull it around the necks of the other plants if you don't want it there. Um, uh, Rosia, which is the, this one in the foreground on the right, is a, is a taller sedge, very kind of bright green, bright, brighter colored, I guess. The, um, the Pennsylvanica is more emerald, deep green. And taller, uh, 12, even 14 inches in flower. Thick, thick, thick clumps. It's really, it's really stunning. I've been using it in planters because it's so, so wonderful. Um, very, very hardy, very adaptable to partly, partly and dry goes into quite a bit of sun and even though it's dry. So it was really a wonderful, a wonderful plant to use. Um, Pachyra, um, again, I use both of these. The Pachyra aurea I've used for decades and never fails to impress. Um, it has this, this, uh, this is the one on the left, has this uh, kind of wide heart-shaped foliage, evergreen. Um, do, likes moisture, but to, but is very dry tolerant. Likes to be a little more shaded, especially if it's in the dry. Um, it's one of the things that I had in that swale planting where it gets a lot of sun. I guess I guess not full sun. I guess, but certainly half sun, and it's in quite wet, and it, it's beautiful. It just does beautifully. The one on the right is um, Pachyra obavata, which I've learned about and started using um, only a few years ago. It has a, a small rounder leaf and has a more kind of dainty, tidy habit. It also takes more sun in a drier situation. So it, if anything, it's even a little bit more adaptable, which, which um, I've enjoyed learning about it. I've been using that a lot. Um, evergreen clumps, just really wonderful. Uh, purple undersides of the leaves and has it just really a lot has a lot going going for it. Um, Panicum virgatum. Um, everybody knows these. I'll go quickly through these. This is on the left is uh, one of the many cultivars. I'm not sure which one. I think it's called purple tears. Um, in the garden. On the right, this is um, a Bridgeton planting where I've used it as a wall. Um, that's a Shenandoah. Um, and in front of that is the, um, the Aster um, October Skies that makes the, these wonderful hedges in dry sun. Um, so that's the old switchgrass. Um, high value to bees and to wildlife. And um, I, I grow quite a number of them. And I will, for the first time, have plugs of the species because I've never had the species. I've always had cultivars. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Portoranthus trifoliatus. Um, I like Gelania, that's the old name. Uh, I think it's prettier. So I always call it Gelania. Um, another just stunning native plant. Um, whoops, go back. Um, Grows in three to four three to four foot vase shaped clumps. You can see the picture on the right has a very well bloomed out. This is in not even half sun, probably three hours of sun. 
Um, and you can see it's sort of almost leaning because it, it's so tall and big. Um, uh, delicate flowers over a long period of time, seed heads, kind of reddish pink seed heads after that that are just as pretty as the flowers. And um, beautiful, beautiful fall color. Pycnanthemum muticum. Um, I grow four different mountain mints, pycnanthemums, and they're all fabulous. This is the oldest one for me that I've used the longest. And I think it's the one most people are most familiar with. Um, that's my plants up here. Um, growing uh, upright, expanding clumps to about three feet, um, silvery green aromatic foliage, blooms in the summer in these, these kind of silvery bracts, um, attracts a huge variety of pollinators. One of the biggest, um, all of the, all of the pick um, species are, are very high value and um, do, do very well in a, in a range of, um, in a range of uh, sightings. Um, Solidago casea, um, woodland, uh, woodland goldenrod. This is your goldenrod for your shade garden. And one of my favorites, um, it's happiest in partly, partly in dry, um, grows in these uh, vase shaped clumps, two to three feet tall, beautiful with fur, whoops, keep doing that. Beautiful with ferns and with asters. Um, lovely clump former and um, just attracts a lot of uh, butterflies and birds and uh, blooms for a very long time um, all through the end of the summer and into the fall. And you can see how sort of delicate it is. It's also known as blue stemmed goldenrod and wreath goldenrod because you can kind of see that it blooms all along the stem. So if you took, took the stem and made it round, you would have a wreath. And I think this is my last thing, um, is the lovely grass, Barabolus heterolepis. And um, this, is a, this is the grass that I used in that planting in Bridgeton in the parking lot. So we'll see how that does. This is a, a, a sun lover, but I have found that it will adapt to a little bit of shade and um, it just doesn't get quite the colorful flower and the colorful interest in the fall. But in the sun, this is the right hand picture of it, it is it in its bloom, usually sort of August into September. And then it gets these wonderful colors in the fall and grows in clumps, um, is, is truly put me in a gritty soil, don't feed me, don't mulch me, don't water me, just leave me alone. And it, and it does beautifully. So it's a great problem solver. Um, this will just go through quickly. I don't, I'm not going to name everything. These are just, um, I mean, I could, I've, I wrote them all down, but I'm trying to get to some questions because I know it's, I'm, I've been talking a long time. Um, so all, mostly all well-known and, and well-loved. And what I'll do is um, I will try to caption these. I just didn't quite get it done. Um, You know, the native geranium, there's that sweet fern again. Um, on the right there is, a, is an antenaria, which is a tiny, tiny little ground cover with, with packs big value. Um, the middle picture on the bottom is a um, Monarda bradburiana, which is the Eastern bee balm, which is a shorter bee balm. And you can see these are, this is the seed heads. And they're just, it's just a wonderful colony spreading plant. And the picture on the right is Menarda punctata, um, the spotted bee balm, which is also wonderful to use. Um, Scutellaria incana, um, the um, uh, prairie smoke, um, Geum triflorum. And um, the three pictures on the bottom are one of my favorite things, which is spikenard. Um, a race, uh, uh, Aralia racemosa, Ameri American spikenard. Wonderful, extraordinary native plant. Um, it comes up out of the ground, gets bigger every year to the point of like six feet, um, but comes out of the ground every year and makes these ex extraordinary 
umbels of gorgeous uh, berries. And, um, and then you can see they get picked clean and then, and then the, the little stems of the berries are still very ornamental as it, as it kind of goes to sleep in, in the fall. Really a, a wonderful plant for, for dry, bony, dry shade. And uh, these are just a few more. Uh, we didn't, I didn't talk much about echinacea. We all love echinacea. I love all the cultivars. I just, I just suggest to people that they, you know, get some straight species, purpurea, and just put some in your garden. And that way you know that the critters are gonna have the straight species um, to go to. And this last one is, um, this is a wonderful, uh, this is a wonderful echinacea palida that I just had these beautiful photos of, but just the left is with it in bud. And the middle one is after it has opened its flowers. Um, really a wonderful special prairie plant. Uh, again, a high value pollinator plant. On the right is Actea racemosa, the old Simis fuga, I still call them Sinis, doing its beautiful bloom. Also huge pollinator butterfly plant. And the bottom just shows um, an Amsonia cultivar that I use a lot called Blue Ice that grows about 15 inches tall and, and makes these, these lovely patches of blue flowers and the foliage turns yellow in the fall. So then there's just a couple things on the end here. Managing how your plantings fill in takes watching and learning. On the left is a new planting of uh, blueberry sod years ago. And on the right is, whoops. And on the right is about five years later, you can see how well it's filled in. And it just takes time. And during that time, you have, you gotta go in, you gotta pull the tree seedlings out and roll the little pine trees that seed in there. Just manage it a little bit, um, keep a little cover on it. I use a wonderful erosion control mulch as cover on most of my native plantings called super humus, which is um, invaluable to me. And um, I think, yeah, so the, the, the last notes is if you can, if you have place on your property to put in a, a landscape planting, not a garden, but a planting, then, you know, plant to create colonies intentionally because that's what they want to do anyway. Large groupings planted thickly, cover well, protect from weeds and from browsing by the deer mostly until well established. And then just watch it grow and become part of your landscape. So just to close up before some questions, um, please uh, I, I, use me as a resource. Um, it's really more and more what I'm here for um, is uh, to, to help folks learn about native plants, to help them find the plants that they need and to inspire them to, to, to really plant. And don't, you know, don't just come, come and get one little plant, but you know, get 10 of them and, and plant a patch and let it, let it do what it does. Because that's how we can really make a difference with all habitat that we're losing and all the plants that we're losing every day. Even here in Maine, um, we can really make, make a difference by, by doing that. So um, enough about me. Oh. And um, anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Lucia. That was really fascinating. And the plants are just so gloriously beautiful. Um, if you could uh, unshare your screen at this point so that we can see as many faces as yes. possible, that's great. And Good. we already have three questions in the chat. So I, let's start with those. Okay. Uh, and then uh, anyone else who would like to ask a question, either add it to the chat or make sure you're visible and then wave your hands around. But we've got three to get us going in the chat already. So I'll read them out in case everyone's not looking at the chat. So the first one says, do you have any suggestions for ground cover as erosion along the driveway and it gets pushed with the snowplow in a, in a windy afternoon sun exposure? Yeah, those sides of the driveway places are tough. Um, 
because they do get messed with in the winter, no matter how you mark or care for stuff. And uh, it's one thing to have like your grass mowed up, but it's another to have your fabulous native plants get uh, all plowed up. Um, and yeah, there, there's erosion, there's salt, there's a lot of, a lot of things. I, I try to look to the roadsides because all those same things are happening on our roadsides, especially on the smaller roads. Um, and I would suggest maybe doing, starting with something like Schizocherium scoparium, the little blue stem, that is, that is one of our major roadside plants that you'll see, um, grows mm, two and a half to, to three feet probably in flower, is very, very tough, grows right up, you'll see it growing right up toward the highways. So it gets all of that salt and plow winging and all of that mess of sand and salt that's there in the spring comes right up through it. Um, is very strong rooted, so it really does deal with erosion. And it's it'll make these thick, thick clumps. And if some of them kind of get plowed up once in a while, it's not going to hurt it any. It's just going to grow back. So that would that would be a starting place. And then in that framework, you could add some other wonderful things, maybe back a little ways that would that would ornament it. Um, if you if you didn't just want it to be just those grass patches. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about as different a circumstance as you could possibly imagine from a driveway. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions for a vernal pool area? A marsh marigold is one that I think of. That's not me, sorry, that's the question. A Gwen Nagel suggests. Yes, yes. Um, hi, Gwen. Um, Marsh marigold, yeah. Um, I guess a lot would depend on how big the pool is and how open the space is and how sunny or not sunny it is, like how, what the light is as to what would thrive in that situation. I, I do not have a lot of experience doing those kinds of plantings. Um, and I'm trying to think now when the last time was that I maybe was at a vernal pool at the right time of year to kind of see what nature was providing for plants. So I, I can't help you a whole lot with that one, but I'm very interested to learn more about it. I'll have you come over and look at yes, it. Yes, and look at it. Yeah, yeah. That's a little different from some of the rest of your landscape. Oh, exactly. <laughs> My, pool. Rest yeah. of mine is partly, it's partly, partly and shady. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Partly, 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 but but wet and dry, right? So partly, partly wet and dry yeah. and shady. That's a little bit of a different way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like a right. challenge right. to me. Yes. Big challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lucia. Yeah, I just need more information, yeah. Okay, and the third question oh. in the chat from the Boros family, I hope I'm saying your name right, I apologize if I'm not, it says, do you have any suggestions reconverting a lawn into a meadow? Thank you in advance. Oh, that's, yeah, that's one. I mean, there's volumes out there and all kinds of things going on about that. Um, I guess the first step that I would take is do, do kind of do some of those planning tasks that I outlined to get a sense of, you know, what, what, what is the soil like? And you can tell a lot of things by how well the lawn is growing, like, uh, you can tell pretty quickly how shady it is, how gravelly the soil is, but finding out um, some of that information will, will help inform you. And then also kind of like uh, how, how it, how this, this meadow area relates to your living space and how you would want to design it as far as how tall, um, how much you want it to be open to go through and what's on the back edge of it. So what, what kind of a transition is it making? So again, a lot of questions and then the meadow plants then depend on that. You know, there's moist meadow plants and there's, there's uh, gravelly um, meadow plants and then there's sun and shade. So um, again, a little more, a little more information um, 
as far as what, what the site is like um, is needed to make a real recommendation. Sorry, I had muted myself because I'm in downtown Boston and there's a helicopter flying over. Oh my goodness. I can't, can't do much about, but I, oh my goodness. Um, so apologies for the noises in the background. Um, so thank you for that. Now, um, oh, we do have, uh, so it says, can we get on the list about the spring plant sale? So yes, so I was, yeah, that? I was going to ask, so what, what would be most useful? Um, uh, an email list, and I could send the lists out and also notifications about plant sales or, we don't, we don't I mean, really anyone know. on Facebook can just follow me on Facebook, but I know everybody isn't and more power to you if you're not, yeah. but um, we, that, we don't really have a way to get a list out to people because people right. join this and they're not necessarily on our email list. So right. we, the list you've already right. provided is on the library's website. Right. But yes, in terms and of if yeah. they want to contact you directly. And my, e my you know. email and the Facebook page are on that list. So maybe okay. emailing me and I'll I'll make I'll make I'll make a list out of okay. you and and make sure that you get those notifications. That would be great. So yeah. to find that plant list, just to repeat in case you weren't here at the beginning, if you go to the Charlotte Halls Memorial Library homepage, um, there is a, um, well, right now at the moment, there's an announcement of this talk and details right there on the homepage, but that will go down after today. But at the top of the page, there is a speaker series button and it lists every speaker we've had. And the most recent speaker on the bottom of that list will be Lucia Terry. And if you click on that, it will take you back to the details of her talk and the list plant list is there. And that contains, she says, her, her contact information. So yeah. that's what I would suggest yeah. you do. And that's my um, native plant list of all the, the native things that I'm growing. And it has my, my list of my native plug, uh, native species plugs that I've already ordered for the spring and the grasses that I've already ordered. But, um, and those could be added to. So this is a great time if anybody can think about like a quantity, like if you want plugs of, uh, of the little blue stem, um, it's such a wonderful way to get, a, to get a large planting in at, you know, two and three, two and three dollars a piece. Well, I think um, the bottom so line, that list is on there too. So the bottom line on this, I think you need to to get in direct contact with Lucia when it comes to actually ordering things because yep. the library can't really get involved in the right, right, right. The, you know, the, the details yeah. of so that. So email me. Yep. But if you have more questions about the garden or plants, there's no more left in the chat. But if anyone who's on the on my screen puts their hand up, I can take a question. But many of you are have your videos off. So if you want to ask a question, you have to put your video on. Okay, well, I have one question. And then we're, okay. oh, it's almost eight o'clock. Actually, I'll forget my question because I don't want to go past time without saying a couple more things. Okay. So the most important thing I want to do is to thank Lucia. Thank you very much, Lucia. It was really terrific. Very, very nice of you. I much appreciate you agreeing to do this. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that this was jointly sponsored by us at the Charlotte Hall Memorial Library and by the Greater Lovell Land Trust. So thank you to the Land Trust for teaming up with us for this. We were yeah, really wonderful. With that. Um, and I also want to announce our next speaker in our speaker series, which is a little different. Uh, once a year, starting a tradition that started last year, uh, the Friends of the Charlotte Halls Memorial Library uh, put on an extra special speaker. Well, not that you weren't special, Lucia. That's not what I mean. But last no, year's extra special. special I get it. Was, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> last year's was Stephen King, and I'm sorry, but he does draw kind of a big. Well, crowd. that's extra special right there. And uh, yeah. and in January we have um, Lois Lowry. I'm not sure oh, if I'm pronouncing her late right, but there'll be a winter evening with Lois Lowry on Thursday, the 27th of January at seven o'clock. And if you'd like to attend that one then you have to join the Friends of the Charlotte Hall Memorial Library. Nice. Uh, and to join it as a student is a $5 minimum. To join it as an adult is a $25 minimum. The sky's the limit. Please feel free to give us as much money as you'd like to, because that's what makes all of these possible. Yep. yep. Um, and then you will automatically get sent a link to that event, which will be a, a bigger event than our uh, all our monthly talks are. 
Um, and it, it, if you're not familiar with Lois Lowry, she is a main resident. She's the author of Number the Stars and The Giving, among other books. And The Giving, I'm astonished to hear, sold 12 million copies. That's a lot of books. <laughs> Um, the, the Giver. So, sorry, Maury, I just have to correct. It's The Giver. Oh, I'm sorry. It's The Giver. That's Thank right. you. Thank yes, you very much. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did correct it. The Giver. Um, so that's our, our next talk in our talk series. Um, and so I think with that, thank you again, Lucia. Everybody have wonderful holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Whatever holidays you celebrate or just have a, a great time and a, a better 2022, I hope. Yes. And, and thank you all for joining us. Okay. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Oops. Was